Pavan, you're live. Okay, thank you. Hello and welcome to this Royal College of Psychiatrists and Rainbow Special Interest Group webinar on Pride. My name is Pavan Joshi and I'm chair-elect for the Rainbow SIG. The Rainbow SIG is sexuality and gender diversity special interest group of the college and we aim to promote and research the mental health of LGBTQ plus people. Please see link about the Rainbow SIG in comment section. I'm delighted to chair today's webinar with such a fantastic lineup of speakers. But before I introduce the panel, can I take this opportunity to welcome you all from wherever you are and thank you for joining in today. Starting with a few housekeepings, uh, this is an hour long webinar and we have four panelists. With regards to the structure, we will have each panelist speak for us about 10 minutes, speak with us for about 10 minutes. We will remind them at nine minute mark and I will appear after 10 minutes on the screen so they would know it's time to conclude. Once we have heard from all our panelists, a Q&A session, Q session will follow. So can I invite you all to post your questions in the Q&A box and comments in the chat section throughout the webinar. We encourage all supportive and thought-provoking questions and comments. However, any discriminatory entries will be removed. We will try and take as many questions as possible, time permitting, in the order they appear. Now, with great pleasure, let me introduce our speakers today. Our panelists today are Professor Dinesh Bugra, former president of Royal College of Psychiatrists, Dr. Louise Theodosiu, prominent college and Rainbow Sig member, Dr. Saul Levin, CEO and medical director of American Psychiatric Association, and Dr. Paul Giluli, chief medical officer of East London NHS Foundation Trust. Thank you very much for joining us today. And with that, we are delighted to have you all here with us. One final note, all our speakers have amazing portfolio of fantastic careers behind them. However, given this webinar is for an hour only, I'll keep their introduction brief. So without further ado, let's start. Our first speaker is Professor Dinesh Bugra. Professor Bugra has been a Dean between year, 2000, year 2003 and 2008 and past president of Royal College of Psychiatrists from 2008 to 2011. And thus far, the only president elected unopposed. He has also been a president of World Psychiatric Association from 2014 to 2017 and president of British Medical Association between 2018 and 19. I still recall my first meeting with him when I went to meet him after my membership at the college and he generously offered me an Indian suite called Gulab Jamun, which is offered in many celebratory occasions in India and welcomed me to the college. Professor Vugra, thank you for joining today and over to you. Thanks very much, Pavan. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a strange occasion uh, because it's partly about um, pride in what we do. And it's also about pride in sexuality, sexual orientation, diversity, and so on and so forth. And I have always been somewhat nervous about using the term pride, because we know it's one of the deadly sins. But it also means that uh, this allows you to not necessarily be proud, but be comfortable with who you are, what you do, and so in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk a bit about the institutional memory within the college and my own story, but it's also um, one of the things that I've learned as I've grown older and uh, become a grumpier old man. Um, it is about institutional amnesia that quite often people forget what it was like because you feel so comfortable with the way things are. And one of the lessons is that you should never, ever, ever, ever take your liberties for granted. And I remember when the proposal for uh, what was uh, not called Rainbow Sig at that time was L LGBT special interest group, when it came to the college council, uh, Bob Kendall, uh, was the president at that time. And there were three of us, openly, slightly open, uh, not so open gay members of the council. And there was quite a reluctance to set up the group. And I remember having a fairly heated debate as to why we needed it. 
and it went through and the uh, special interest group was set up. And I think Michael King was the um, first chair of the group. And we have come a long way, but it is um, that there have been pressures, particularly in my presidency on me that I wasn't doing enough uh, for LGBT individuals. I think one of the key lessons for me was that there are things that you can do openly and things that you can do behind the scenes. And one of the big challenges really is understanding when you need to employ stick and when you need to employ a carrot. And at the same time, and I remember uh, during my basic training in Leicester, my MPhil was on doctor's attitudes to male homosexuality. And I did a survey and it was amazing that my clinical tutor at that time was very supportive, very positive. Um, they spoke to the chief exec of the trust at that time, although it wasn't a trust, it, was, it predates that period. And they supported me in the survey, they supported uh, analysis, and it eventually led to my MPhil through Leicester University and subsequent several publications. But when I took over as the presidency of the World Psychiatric Association, there were bigger challenges. And uh, I'm grateful to Saul Levin for his support and Vanessa Cameron for hers uh, when she was chief executive of the college while I was president of the World Psychiatric Association in creating position statements and documents on uh, so-called conversion therapy, opposing it, on uh, support for LGBT uh, doctors and health professionals around the globe. And one of the interesting things was that at that time, one of our psychiatry colleagues in Indonesia decided uh, that uh, homosexuality needed to be put back into their local classificatory system as a mental illness. And we were contacted uh, and all three organizations, WPA, Royal College of Psychiatrists and the American Psychiatric Association, we issued three separate statements um, supporting the fact that this was a normal variation, it was not a psychiatric disorder and had no place in the scheme of things. And fascinatingly at that time, they, it, it was picked up by the Minister for Health in Indonesia and she called up um, individuals to question them as to be in it. Here are three big organizations which are saying this is a variation and how are you identifying it as mental illness? For me, that was a pivotal point in understanding, um, one, how do you work together? Two, to support people in uh, other cultures, low and middle income uh, countries and what that means. And at that time, there was also that um, uh, Maudsley had what was uh, called a support group uh, for doctors, particularly psychiatrists. And, uh, and I would like to pay a tribute to Professor Anthony Mann and acknowledge the work that he's done over uh, the past few decades in supporting uh, gay, lesbian trainees. Um, and at that particular time, I'm talking in the sort of 60s and 70s, yeah, that's 1960s and 1970s, that um, uh, there was very limited support for people. Uh, quite often, if you know the word got out, uh, there were, uh, you may not get shortlisted, you may not get support, but Anthony, uh, Dr. Yong Lok Ong, uh, Jeremy Bolton and others created the support group and in various positions at various levels, they continue to support trainees, both in terms of uh, preparation for exams, but also finding jobs and mentoring people uh, once they became consultants and so on and so forth. So again, uh, one of the big challenges consistently has been uh, acknowledgement of diversity. 
and there are still um, challenges even within this country, although we may take pride in um, how long away we have come, there are challenges for people who may be struggling in small places, who may be struggling in bigger places, who may feel uh, that they are uh, not supported. But again, I want to sort of uh, close by repeating that uh, we should never take our liberties for granted. And we've seen it in the states and maybe Seoul might touch that in the times of um, uh, Donald Trump, how risky it became to be a minority of any kind. And similarly, similar things are happening. And although um, I have fought the corner in my own way and given evidence to Kenyan High Court and Singapore High Court to decriminalize uh, same-sex behavior, we haven't succeeded. But that's a fight that we should not be giving up. And that's something that we need each other's support and we need to support each other to make sure that um, we don't go backwards and we keep pushing the equality and equity uh, agenda. And within that, I think there are also challenges for LGBT patients and what we ought to be doing for them in terms of supporting them, in terms of asking the right questions and in terms of being culturally competent to uh, manage that. And I'm sure uh, Louise will cover some of that. So once again, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bugra, for sharing your insight about the Rainbow Six journey and about your work on LGBTQ plus matters as a leader while working in the college and World Psychiatric Association. Thank you very much. Now, a quick reminder to those who recently joined us. Welcome to this college and Rainbow Six webinar on Pride. Please do send us any comments and questions in the relevant section. We'll take as many questions as possible, time permitting during the Q&A at the end. Our next guest is Dr. Louise Theodosu. Dr. Theodosu is a child and adolescent psychiatrist based in Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. Louise works part-time in an innovative adolescent service based in a community center in Moss Side called Emerge. Emerge supports 16 and 17 year olds with a wide range of mental health needs. The team has a proud tradition of service user involvement and a commitment to equality and diversity with a celebration of difference and identity development at the heart of everything they do. Thank you for joining Louise, over to you. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be speaking on the same platform as so many people that I, I very much admire. Um, I'm really, really excited to be part of the proud um, celebrations um, this month, and I'd just like to say how proud I am of my Emerge team generally, and two of my excellent colleagues, um, Sarah and Leslie, did the podcast, which is also available as part of the Pride celebration, so I feel like Manchester's Pride community is, is doing their bit to be part of what's happening. I think for me, when I think about Pride, and when I think about um, my identity, both as a doctor and um, as, as an out lesbian woman, the two things that are most important to me are family. And um, I've been incredibly lucky in the families that I've been part of. I'm part of a fabulous um, Greek family that brought me across from Africa and looked after me when I didn't quite know what to do with myself when we first moved to the UK. And they've continued to be incredibly proud of me and, and they were proud of me and used the word proud of me before pride was something that I understood in an LGBTQ context. Although if I'm honest, I always knew that I was LGBTQ. And I'm very proud of the fact that my family were able to accept that and to understand that very quickly. And that's something that, that I'm, I will always be grateful for. I think anybody who's been to Manchester is aware of the fact that Manchester in my mind is a place where there is a continuous reinvention, a continuous celebration and a continuous awareness, both of the, I suppose, the fragility and the brevity of life, but also of the wonderfulness of life. And to me, this slide that we've got here sums up everything. And behind me, I've got Tara. Do you want to say anything, Tara? Hello, lovely to meet you. Uh, my name's Tara. I'm the team secretary and I work alongside Louise uh, in our little Emerge family. Yes. And one of the reasons for Tara being here today 
is that as you can see from our slide, we've all celebrated being LGBTQ allies. And to me, one of the things that's most exciting about diversity and about making sure that we're all just thinking outside of our own boxes is making sure that I, as a lesbian woman, am also thinking about what it's like to be from other minority communities. I don't know what it's like to be trans, but I absolutely want to 100% support trans people. I don't know what it's like to be physically disabled, but I want to be part of these, I want to be part of the understanding and the empathy around these communities while at the same time allowing them to lead on the dialogue. And I think what's fantastic here is that if we look at our allies, we can see here that Sean, one of my colleagues, you can't quite read his pledge, but he's talking about the importance of making sure that LGBTQ people LGBTQ people from minority ethnic communities are also supported. And to me, pride and diversity and making sure that absolutely everybody is taken forward in terms of identity is incredibly important. And it's one of the reasons why I feel so lucky to work in Emerge. Can I have my next slide, please? And I think what's brilliant is that what I've done here is I've taken different photographs from around our Emerge space. So what you can see here is that we've got the same space where we have our team meetings in times when COVID isn't happening, where we eat our lunch, the kitchen's just there to the right, and also where we make sure that anybody coming into the space feels valued and feels that they can actually speak openly. One of the things that I found really, really poignant and really important in terms of working with children and young people is that around my room, as you can see from behind me, there's little indicators that I'm an LGBTQ ally. There's the rainbow flag there, and there's various other rainbow related um, items in, my, in the other office that I work in in North Manchester. And what I found really interesting is that young people look around for these signs, as I remember doing when I was a young person. You look to see who is safe, who's going to actually listen to me, who's going to make me feel that I can actually you know, be open and honest about who I am. And to me, what's fantastic about Emerge is that Emerge has created this space and celebrated it. This is not, you know, it's okay. This is, it's fantastic that you have diversity and that you want to share it with other people and that you want to be part of these wider communities. You're safe here. We will support you. I don't think we always get it right. I don't think anybody always gets it right. But I suppose what I would say is that having been on my own personal LGBTQ journey, having a fantastically supportive girlfriend who most of the time approves of what I'm doing and a family who 100% support me, what I know is that actually alliances, pride, these kind of things are incredibly important. Next slide, please. So this is the final slide I've got of our waiting room. And to me, this captures so much of what is important in Emerge. On the left there, you can see young people communicating their visceral distress through some of their artwork. And on the right, you can see young people who are experiencing hideous and subjugatory events. And in the middle, we've got the new pride flag, which absolutely acknowledges trans identities and black and minority ethnic identities. And to me, this is what is so incredibly important if we are to actually move forward as a world and get things right in the future. Because what I would like to think is that we can move to a time where people actually are really comfortable, perhaps don't need the boxes that I need. They don't need to be a, a lesbian in some old fashioned middle aged way. They can just be whoever they are and love whoever they are and not define their ethnicity and their identity in the ways that I do. Now I recognize that that is a long way away. And what fascinates me is that every time I log into any new website, um, if for example, I, I want to buy soap from the body shop, I end up having to put in my gender identity all sorts of information about myself and sometimes my sexuality, which really doesn't seem that relevant if you're just trying to buy body wash in an ethical fashion. But there you are. This is still the point where we are. But I'm really, really hopeful that we can move forward and that we can actually take away these boxes and move forward to a time where we can just support one another and where actually all of these identity issues can be seen as diversity. And I, I, I cannot pretend to understand anybody else's experience, and I wouldn't presume that they could understand mine, but to a point where we can actually think, this is who I am, this is who you are. Fundamentally, I will treat you with respect, you will treat with me with respect, and that will be the most important thing. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Louise, for highlighting the importance of friends and family and also working in a team that is LGBTQ plus positive and supportive. Where are we, where we are seen and acknowledged and also reminding us why this is especially important for young service users and to create an environment that is safe, positive and uplifting. Um, next for all attendees, Luis is also one of our exec in Rainbow Six. Please do look up our SIG website link in the comment section and join us during college's virtual international Congress between 21st and 24th of June. And among many other fantastic sessions there, there is an amazing relevant symposium on 21st of June, which will be chaired by Professor Helen Kilaspi. Our next speaker is Professor Saul Levin. Professor Levin is the CEO and medical director of the American Psychiatric Association, APA, and a clinical professor at the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. Prior to that, he was the head of the Department of Health of Washington in DC. Professor Levin is originally from South Africa, where he got his MBBCH, and he also has a Master of Public Administration from Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, and honorary fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Professor Levin is the first APA CEO and medical director who is gay, and he has been a leader in many of the LGBTQ plus medical associations in the USA. Thank you for joining Professor Levin, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yoshi. Uh, so I really want to thank uh, the Royal College of Psychiatry for hosting this really important discussion, uh, an important global ally, I think, to the whole movement. Uh, and I have to also thank uh, the Rainbow Sig for organizing this and thank you for, uh, for inviting me to come and talk a little. So I was actually a little uh, um, uh, divided as to what sort of talk should I give? Do I give a personal talk of my journey and coming out as gay? Or do I do it from the perspective of being the CEO and medical director of the American Psychiatric Association, but doing it from the perspective of being gay? So I'm actually gonna try and do a little of both uh, as we zoom along in this talk, um, and then we'd be happy to take questions afterwards. So as a gay man in the House of Medicine and as an international medical graduate in the United States, I think I have some unique insights into the issues facing the LGBTQI uh, people of today and how these issues intersect with both health, mental health and politics. I was born in South Africa during the apartheid when being a gay person was enough to get you a seven year prison uh, sentence if you were arrested. I, I witnessed a lot of homophobia growing up and during my time in medical school in Johannesburg, particularly during the rise as AIDS began to show, to show itself in the white community, it had always been there in the black community, but at that time we didn't know it as HIV, we saw it as just wasting disease in the black community. Um, in 1994, the post-apartheid government came to power. They very quickly decided it was time to change, uh, get a new constitution. And the big issue was with LGBTQ be incorporated into that uh, constitution where everyone was treated equally and fairly. And I have to begin to talk about one of my heroes. And that person is Simon Nicoli, uh, a black young man uh, who was gay, hidden in the closet, but really fought in the struggle and he was ultimately arrested by the apartheid government, put into prison with many of the leadership. He actually was fairly close to uh, Madiba, you know, uh, President Mandela, and he never told anyone while he was in prison that he was gay. And as they began to discuss the idea of what should be the new constitution in the country, he noticed no one ever brought up LGBTQ you know, uh, at the time. And he realized that he couldn't keep quiet, that he needed to talk about it. So he finally in prison, where you have very homophobic police, and in some ways, the gay community within the black community was also a little ostracized and seen different. Um, he came out to them. And at first they were a little shocked, a little, you know, a little surprised, but he began to explain to them what it was like uh, being a gay person. And in the end, they all agreed that they had to have LGBTQ getting the same rights as everyone. 
So when I talk about can anyone make a difference, everyone on this call, and there are a lot of us on this call, I'm busy seeing we've got 121 people sitting on this call right now, can make a difference. And it takes courage, but also you have to feel you want to do, take that step into courage, and in some ways come out and tell it. I always used to joke to my family, and in some ways at work, that if ever I had to write an autobiography, it would be hidden in plain sight. That I was gay. If you just uh, Googled me, you would see I'm clearly gay. And it's amazing how many of my members who clearly they know I'm the first CEO who's gay yo, in the APA, still ask me about how's my wife and how's my kids. Yo. And it surprises me when they do do it. In the beginning, I used to sort of evade the issue. And now I've decided, you know, what have I got to lose? I just come out and say, no, I don't have a wife. I'm gay. I don't have a husband at the moment, you know, and I don't have kids, you know. And it is surprising to see the different reactions on it. But it reminds me that the only way we're going to truly get true freedom here is for everyone to not be silent and to speak up. And I think that's what we're seeing with Black Lives Matter, what we saw with the death of George Floyd that changed the nation and changed, I think, many countries. It is that you have to begin to speak up. And that's part of what I'm trying to do at APA. Um, I do say that uh, homophobia still abounds at the, in, in the United States. Even with all the rights we've gained, it's there one minute and gone the next minute. Uh, we clearly saw it in the Trump administration that um, he essentially did away with all transgender people in the military, who happened to be all the people who were actually the interpreters, particularly in the Middle Eastern languages, that he said had to leave the government, had to leave the military. So I always say that the Supreme Court is really where we're either being made safe as a gay person or not safe as a gay person, because that is in some ways the final arbiter. But I do have a great vision for the APA. And it is a vision that I do have to say coming out of a lot of pain as we move through Black Lives Matter and look at what the Black community has experienced over the last 400 years. And there are a number of gay leaders within that community. So I think that's some of the things that I always look at. Clearly, a major issue for us in mental health as psychiatrists and in any of the psychological mental health fields was the taking out of the DSM in, 19, in 1973, uh, where John Fryer came in a big mask. And at that meeting, along with Barbara Giddings and Frank Kameny, he stood up and said, I am a gay man and I'm a psychiatrist. And it was that cascade that then began the association moving away from the psychoanalytic theory to say, well, is it really a disease? And literally within a year and a half, they had totally removed it out of the DSM. Now, however, you're going to say there's still parts of it in the DSM. Some of it was a slow take. But I do have to say um, that overall, the majority of my members do believe in LGBTQI freedom you know, and all rights. And for that, I'm exceptionally proud of APA. The Biden administration is clearly a lot more progressive and friendly to LGBTQI people. And I think I'm hoping that the troubles we're seeing in the different states, where we have 26 states that still have, are allowed to do conversion therapy in adults, that we fight every day to ensure that everyone should not be forced to undergo conversion therapy because of a religious belief in a community that uh, believes that gay is wrong. So in closing, I wanna say this month of pride, I have to say, I'm so happy to be an openly gay psychiatrist whether people realize it or not. I think it has really made my life a lot more whole and I looked at all the heroes in my life going right up from a little boy. And I came out with a whole bunch of names. I've spoken about Simon Nicoli. You know, I have another one, Harvey Thompson, who was a Green Beret in the Vietnam War, was the first physician ever to walk in the San Francisco Gay Pride Parade with a placard saying, I'm a physician and I'm gay. And long do I remember his memory for taking that step in the very early days 
way before HIV AIDS, when it wasn't okay to stand up and do it. And then I have to thank, you know, Professor Dinesh Bugra, amazing leader, not only the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the WPA, but even the British Medical Association. You know, what an internationalist. And for that, I really want to say, you know, we are all in this together. Every one of us has to fight for both LGBTQ rights, but for all people's rights from the black community to the Hispanic community and we witnessed on the border, you know, to the Asian committee where hate crimes are being done against them, uh, to the Native Americans of the United States that essentially genocide was created. And I think on that ground, uh, we all have to always know that the hierarchy of pain doesn't work. My pain is not any more than your pain particularly the minority and underrepresented groups. And that's what I aspire to do in my term at APA, to remind everyone that we're all in this together. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much, Professor Levin, for sharing your personal and professional journey with us. As a gay man moving from South Africa to US and as a professional and a leader in American Psychiatric Association, highlighting how far we as LGBTQ professionals in psychiatry have come, and also for a reminder of the challenges ahead and then that there is still a long way to go. Our final panelist is Dr. Paul Giluli. Dr. Giluli is a consultant forensic psychiatrist and chief medical officer at East London NHS Foundation Trust. He has an extensive experience in medical management and he will look at the challenges of being a medical LGBT leader. Thank you for joining Paul. And I understand there are some technical issues, but I'm really grateful of you. You could actually work those out. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you, Parvin. Um, yeah, we've had some problems getting connections tonight, but alas, I'm, I think I'm here. Um, first of all, can I just say a huge thank you to Parvin and the Rainbow Sig for asking me along today to, to, to talk on this platform. Um, I'm quite overawed, actually, by being asked with such fantastic panellists um, that I'm joining alongside. And if anything can give you pride, it's actually sitting in this panel tonight and listening to some of these awesome stories. And I feel quite, quite um, humbled actually. How do you follow that? How do you, how do you um, go on from that last one from Saul, from Louise, and from Dinesh? Um, can I just make a couple of comments though on the, 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 the talks that have gone so far? Um, Dinesh talked a lot about institutional memory. Um, I can talk to Dinesh from personal memory. The grumpiness didn't come with age. It was always there. I remember it 25, 30 years ago. So don't worry, it, the, the personal memory is important as well. But the thing that you said is really important to me that our liberty is well won, but we can never take it for granted. And I think that's what I want to bring out when I speak today, a wee bit more detail on that and my personal experience of that. Louise, I thought, your, your enthusiasm um, for that diversity and embracing that diversity and how we need to go further in how we embrace that diversity, I think is great. And how that will enthuse our future generations going forward, I think is, is absolutely fantastic. And so I remain in awe of you um, and the journey that you've made, but that need to speak out and that need to be heard and that needs to amplify the voices of those who are not heard is something I want to kind of bring out in, in, in my story as well. Um, so, Pavan's introduced me. My name is Dr. Paul Galuli. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and chief medical officer at ELF. I'm a 54 year old gay doctor. I know you're all quite shocked at that, not the fact that I'm a doctor or that I'm gay, but that I'm 54. But um, it was early use of moisturiser that's helped me maintain these useful looks. But if you actually think about it and count back, I was actually born the year that the Sexual Offences Act was brought in in 1967. And that was a time of the decriminalisation of homosexuality. And um, so born at a real time of hope that we were getting somewhere and that homosexuality will be accepted in our society. Um, however, that kind of a hope and that hope that things would move forward um, came to a crushing blow actually when I started to come out as a gay man. Um, that unfortunately was in the 1980s when the HIV epidemic was just starting to hit um, the, the, the world at that time. 
Um, I'm still haunted by the scenes of the, the huge slab, that plinth actually falling to the ground and shattering, and really wondering to myself, is this, how long am I going to survive? You know, friends were dying around us and friends continue to die from HIV. Um, and you really started to wonder, you know, what kind of life I, will I have ahead? I mean, safe sex, I never knew anything but safe sex. I never knew there could be anything about safe sex. So that was what I was brought into as a young adult. And going through medical school, I was never out of medical school. I was out outside medical school. But in medical school, I kept my private life to myself because I really found it a major challenge on how can I put the two things together of being a successful doctor and also being a successful out gay man. And at that time in Glasgow, I could not see how the two could be compatible, if I'm honest. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think, we, I, Pavan and I talked about this a bit b before um, the, the talk today, and we talked a bit about coming out and how people talk about their coming out stories and how challenging it is to come out to friends, how challenging it is to come out to your family and to your colleagues. I think the biggest challenge to come out to is yourself. And that biggest challenge when the only person you've got to speak to is yourself. And the fact that you know you're different, but how can you put this together with no real role models at that time that you could look up to and say, I'd like to be like him, or I'd like to be like her, or I'd like to be like them. Um, so it was quite a challenging time. So needless to say, you can probably hear by the voice. I wasn't born in London. I was born in uh, Glasgow and trained in Glasgow. And immediately, as, as soon as I finished my house jobs, I ran. Um, and went to came to London and and found the mecca of London at that time, which was quite mesmerising. Um, uh, and a year later, I met my husband. But during my time, we've been through Section Twenty Eight. We've seen Section Twenty Eight come in in the nineteen uh, the late nineteen eighties. I remember protesting against it at that time, but we failed dramatically, and then we've rescinded it. We've also fought for equal age of consent. Um, I was illegal when I came out at first because um, homosexuality, although it was legal, wasn't for consenting men under 21, uh, over 21. Um, and we didn't really get the full age of consent uh, the same until 2000. Um, similarly, we fought for the rights of civil partnerships and then for the rights of equal marriage. So going through all of those, I really felt when I got my consultancy in, in 2000 and I started in medical management, I had met a husband, I had settled down and I really sat back on my fat backside in my white privilege um, state and thought, I've done the fight, we've got here, we've won what we've won, what's everybody bothered about? Um, we've succeeded. And, Oh, how very wrong I now realise I, I was. I, I, how very wrong I, I've realised since that I was. And give you an example of that. Um, four years ago, I took part in an NHS leadership um, uh, training exercise with aspiring other executive directors. Um, and we were asked um, to set up learning groups of seven people, all kind of a deputy medical directors, um, and present a pathway of our personal pathway of how we got an early leadership journey and where we went from childhood right through our family experience right to how we developed into, into our medical career and into leadership subsequently so I sat down and I took my time planning this whole thing out and but, you know I, I was I was I thought I'd got it all done and I was desperate to go first because you're desperate to get up there and kind of present it all and get it all over and done with um, so Basically, unfortunately, somebody got in front of me. Um, and I remember him presenting his, his, his personal life story and thinking, oh my God, I never realized you had to go into that much of detail. Um, but I then started changing my story slightly so that I would add more detail to it. I talked about my mother and my mother um, dying when I was very young. I talked about my father's remarriage. I talked about my relationship with my stepmother and my brothers. Um, I talked about going to higher education and being the first person who went from medical school. Um, and what I real, uh, kind of a real proud my family were of that um, and how I was put on a pedestal in some ways. 
But then I told the story about coming out as a gay man when I was 21 to my family and how that really knocked the pedestal from beneath my feet and how it felt a bit of a, it did not felt a bit, it did feel quite clearly a disappointment. Um, it shattered my, my, my parents and my mother talked about at the time about, and she, she embarrasses herself now by remembering it, but talked about my chosen lifestyle and how I would become a lonely old man. But in those days, she had no other thing to know from what she was given on TV or otherwise. She had no contact with successful gay men or, or lesbians or, or, or transsexuals. So I then continued in my story and told the rest of my story and how I got my medical degree and how I trained in psychiatry, how I was a consultant forensic psychiatrist, how I went into clinic, uh, uh, clinical directorship, done some quality work and done other work and, and worked my way up to, to be a, a chief medical officer. And I finished off my presentation and thought, yeah, I've achieved that, that's quite good. I feel quite relaxed and um, well done. Um, and all I could hear was this deafening silence. And I thought, oh my God, something's went wrong. And one of my colleagues said, hold on a minute. Okay, so you came out when you were 21 to your parents and it had a devastating effect on your family, a massive impact on your family and you, through your relationship with your family. And I went, yeah. And he said, and that's it. And I was like, no, 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 no. He said, well, so what happened? And I said, well, of course, I came down to London. I met Tim in 1993. Tim and I have been together ever since. We had a civil partnership. We get married. We've got a house in Clapham. We've got a dog. Do you know, everything, everything's been really happy with our, our, our lovely life. And he said, but the strange thing is, you never mentioned that in, you, in your time that you've actually been talking. You never mentioned how important your partner was. You've never said anything about Tim. Everybody else talked about their wife. Everybody else talked about the family. Everybody else talked about the divorce. So for me, it really taught me that homophobia sometimes is not just an external thing. It can also be an internal thing. And I think it really taught me then as I came into a leadership and position that has given me power, position and privilege and an opportunity to amplify the voice of others, the people who are not heard. And I think as Dinesh and, and, and Saul has spoken about, I really worry at the minute where we are and where our liberty is, particularly in the things that are happening with our trans siblings. And it frightens me that that's the first move that will happen and we move further and further to actually losing our, losing our liberties. So I think the one thing I would really encourage everybody is stand up and be counted and let your voice be heard. Thank you, Pavan. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you for sharing your inspiring journey as an LGBTQ plus doctor and medical leader and sharing what has been challenging and also rewarding, especially now we can see you supporting so many LGBTQ plus people and professionals. Um, now um, that all our panelists have spoken, um, let's move to our Q&A session uh, with our panelists. Let's say, can we uh, invite them all um, on the screen, please? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the first question uh, comes from, um, comes, um, and, and the question is actually for anybody in the panel, but I will take um, Professor Bhugra as you were the first speaker. The question is, did any of the panel go through a period of assuming you would not be allowed to be a gay doctor? Weird though, that sounds given out medics. Never. Um, I did my medicine in India. I did it in Armed Forces Medical College. Um, there wasn't any question. I think one of the things you have to realize is that there are different bits of your identity that you show. And we heard Paul introduce himself as a 54 year old man. Uh, can I have the name of your moisturizer, please, Paul? Um, and for him, age was predominant over his orientation over medicine. So we all make those kind of judgments. And some of those micro identities vary who we are, who we are with, who we are trying to communicate with. And I think one of the big challenges really is that you know there are 
doctors who are gay, uh, but there are gay doctors and there's a difference. So I think we need to be very clear that one size does not fit all. People have their own journeys, but the message that I'm reading in that question is that we as professionals have to make sure that medical students and nursing students and other uh, health professionals in training need to be supported and need to be made to feel comfortable. And I think that's the key for me. Thank you very much, Professor Google. Next question is, um, and if I could bring you in, Louise, for this question. Um, the question is about, could the speakers say a few words about making it clear to our pa patients, colleagues and allies, allies that psychotherapy, very much like descriptive psychiatry, is at its core on the side of LGBTQI plus people. Although, of course, we are not angels in terms of our prejudices pre and skeletons in the cupboard. I think that's a fantastic question, and I completely agree that we have a responsibility as LGBTQ allies to make sure that people are aware that psychotherapy has moved to a place now where actually anybody can access it and can feel safe accessing it. Um, you know, we're all aware that there have been stereotypes, archetypes, um, you know, things from the past that are perhaps not helpful to the idea of people being fully formed human beings as adult homosexuals. But I think that, you know, all of the people here on this panel are proof that, you know, we can be out proud and, and actually as functioning as, as anybody else in society. And I think that, you know, I, I am not, I, I absolutely loved what um, Paul and Saul said about being out but in a sense, you know, only being out if you choose to look. And I'm certainly active on Twitter. My girlfriend posts all sorts of entertaining things about the food that we make and, and her garden. But, you know, at the same time, I'm, I'm not out to my patients, but I do make it very clear that anybody who chooses to access the therapies that I hope they will take up and feel safe to take up within the departments that I work knows that whatever identity issues they bring will be held separate from their mental health needs and that trauma, emotional dysregulation and things that need to be discussed will be held separate from identity. And, and I think that's something that, that we're very proud of as a progressive mental health service. Thank you, Louise. Um, next question, and I will uh, direct this to Professor Le Levin. How can we create a safer space for staff and patients Sorry, I think it's... So, so thank you uh, for the question. So, um, you know, I, I think Louise said it best. And uh, I, in the early days in coming to the United States, I was very involved with the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association and began to rise up the chain there. And they once asked me, what would you like to do or see as a LGBT, at that time it was just LGBT, uh, you know, was the, uh, the acronym, um, to make it normalized in the general population. And I said to him, you know, I'd love to see in every doctor's office, in every nurse practitioner's office, in every nurse's office, uh, a social worker office, psychotherapist, psychologist's office, the gay flag. It doesn't have to be big, but it just has to be there that when you sit in that waiting room, and you're thinking, am I going to divulge it, no matter what age you are, be it from an adolescent, young kid, adolescent, uh, to an adult. Just seeing that freedom flag there gives them the permission, the permission and the ability to realize this is a safe place that they'd have it there, and I at least need to bring up the topic. Uh, so I think that's the answer that I've always said it, is that you know, uh, it's time for all of healthcare to begin to realize we have to take care of all the minority and underrepresented groups. And we need to vis physically show them that when you come into your space, there's something there that is a flag for that person to say, this is a safe place. I can tell you, Dinesh, one thing I'm gonna argue a little with you. Um, I knew I was gay since I was a little boy. 
you know, uh, in, right from the start, but in very uh, homophobic apartheid South Africa, it was not something you did. But it was the first, uh, first physician I ever met in my second year at medical school. Graham Pierce was his name, who was a gay man and was proud to say it at a time when you really didn't want to do it. And it was just him being there, showing me, mm. oh, do yeah. not hide who you are, really makes it. And I think it comes out, we all come out at the right time for ourselves. But there's also help that you can get from people as you struggle with it uh, on it. So Dinesh, um, uh, you have helped me even in this country by being um, in my country, by being the president of the Royal College and the WPA and you know, to be able to say, yeah, you know, we can be leaders in any organization, you know, to get to as much to the top as you want to go. Um, so I leave that answer and thank you to the, I know there was an anonymous attendee who came from South Africa. Um, it's always good to see a fellow South African, you know, in the, in the audience. And um, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to work out how we can chit chat as well, either before or later, you can always get my email, my email from uh, Pavan, uh, Pavan who has it uh, on it. Thank you very much, Saul. The next question, and I know this is a particular specific question, so I'm not sure if everybody is aware. So I will start with um, asking Paul, you're the next, uh, but other, other people can actually uh, raise hands and, and answer that as well. This question is, what is the panel's view of the Bell and Tavistock case, particularly as Kira called lack of therapy as a reason? She mistakenly thought she was a boy initially. Should the college have a position? Mute. Yeah, no, I've just come off you. I, I think, I think, and the Tavascott case is really important. And I, I, I really, I really feel for the for the people at the Tavascott and the work that they were doing. Um, what worries me is this case has meant that I worry for the kids that were sitting on waiting lists for up to two years for help that are no longer receiving help. And I would like to see reassurance that they are receiving help and the help that they need. And it just worries me with this whole move that we're getting particularly towards trans, um, that we move further and further in that in, in that issue. Certainly, the, I've seen the stuff that's come out in the, the HSG in, in, the, in the past week, um, where they've suggested we should have a debate about trans. I mean, I'm a bit lost in what the debate is. Um, the Equality Act made out what people's rights are, what trans rights are in 2010. Why are we now getting into a debate? And I worry about when people say these things, their lack of acknowledgement of the impact it has on people, particularly on trans. Um, so I think we have to be, I, I think it's very, very difficult political um, area that we're in at the minute, but I think the college does have a role in that. And certainly within, we talked about, uh, Louise talked about Twitter. I'm afraid I'm the opposite. I, I'm, a, I'm an ardent user of Twitter and I'm quite out on Twitter so, so people know I'm, I'm gay as well. But um, I think the bit as well, sorry, Carmen, I'm just coming back to the previous question as well. I think Dinesh's, Dinesh's question was really important. And I think there was somebody said it to me when, you, when I was doing leadership training is you have to come to a point where you decide, are you an LGBT, are you a leader who is LGBT or are you an LGBT leader? And that's a bit about being the LGBT doctor or your doctor who happens to be LGBT. And I think we have to have room for everybody in that. You don't have to be to fit to come in. Everybody needs to be comfortable with who they are and everybody has something to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, one another question we could take because I'm mindful of the time. Uh, the question is for Professor Vugra this time as we have done the first round. Uh, how should we handle trans women on wards when traumatized women feel uncomfortable? Uh, I think it's a difficult one. I mean, what the basic principle has to remain, uh, which is about equity and equality. Whatever people's personal attitudes, they should not interfere with good clinical care. And um, I mean, one of the big challenges I see is, I mean, I, I think Paul had mentioned earlier about that, you know, we may think that we won the LGB battles, we haven't. And, you know, T is still there and it's going to be a big 
battle and you know bell and tavistock is a reflection of that and i'm not going to comment on that particular case because i'm on the board of the tavistock and there are things that um, uh, we need to put aside and that maybe it's a conversation outside this uh, but on the ward, I think the first principle of good clinical care has to be to make sure that everybody feels safe. That's what wards are there for in the true sense of asylum, no matter whether you are um, trans or you're disabled or you're perfectly healthy individual who's distressed because of depression or psychosis or whatever. So I think that's a responsibility for all of us as professionals. And that's where we need allies and that's where we need um, education and training to at, at all levels across all professions to make sure that the care and the best quality care of the patient is paramount. Thank you, Professor Bugra. This has been such a fascinating discussion. I think we could carry on much longer discussing about these interesting and sometimes challenging thought-provoking topics, but I'm afraid time has run out. Um, but before we close, let me start with a big thank you to all of you for joining this webinar today and for all your questions and comments. Uh, your participation made this event come really alive. Uh, next, hope you could join all of me applauding our panelists. Uh, thank you all for sharing your thoughts and your insightful personal and professional journey with us. And last, but uh, certainly not the least, to our amazing college team, uh, Liz, Michael, Mia, and everyone working behind the scenes. Thank you for all your work to make this event possible. And a big thank you to all the Rainbow SIG execs, especially our current chair, Dr. Moira Cooney, for all your work with the SIG. Thank you. So with that, uh, goodbye for now. Uh, until we meet again, and goodbye from panelists. Have a lovely evening wherever you are.